Okay, I, I think we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today to discuss how we can monitor consumer protection risks in digital finance. This webinar is part of Innovations for Poverty Actions Practitioner Forum series, where we convene experts working on consumer protection issues like financial fraud, redress, and over-indebtedness. Um, so our experts today are Daniel Putman, who's a postdoctoral fellow at IPA. He'll be presenting insights from a new IPA toolkit on how we can use new market monitoring tools to really improve consumers' financial health. Um, he'll be joined later on in, in a panel with um, Kevin Muticio, who is the chairman of the board of Digital Lenders Association of Kenya. Paul Adams, a behavioral science, uh, science consultant and formerly of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority and the Dutch Financial Markets Authority. And Christine Hugard, who is the technical director at Sunfree. Um, so we'll start off today's event with the presentation from Daniel, and then he'll be joined after with our other experts for a panel discussion. Um, so I encourage you all in the audience to please ask questions throughout the event. Um, there's both a chat and Q&A feature below, and I'll be monitoring both. Um, and I'll do my best to integrate your comments and questions in the panel discussion. Um, so with that, let's have Daniel get us started. Great. Um, and uh, excuse me, thank you for that introduction, Tanvi. Um, so, um, yeah, just uh, 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 just to get started on this. Um, and so, kind of to uh, uh, to take a step back, right? And so, uh, so first of all, this is uh, this is all joint with the launch of 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 right of this new toolkit that kind of looks at um, using. Uh, Right, right. Excuse me. Like using administrative data uh, for market monitoring, um, and so you know, uh, uh, th this is now online, uh, and so we'll probably drop the link in the chat. Um, but uh, but I encourage you to go look at that. Just a little bit of self promotion. Um, but then, uh, just kind of like right, right. Just to take a step back and say, right, like how come we want to do this in the first place, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so, right, right. Uh, so, how can we want to do uh, to do market monitoring? And so, basically, our two goals here, right? There's uh, there's really two things that we want to do. Uh, we're looking to uh, uh, to kind of learn about different potential consumer protection concerns, right? And then the other thing we're trying to do is we're tr right, right, is we're trying to guide uh, the development of policies and and um, and interventions that uh, that can help with this. And so, I'm going to draw pretty heavily on this first example, which is a collaboration uh, between. Uh, be right, right. Uh, be, be, uh, uh, be, uh, between IPA and the Competition Authority of Kenya, but just uh, just a few examples of this in practice. Um, and so, uh, just I just I just kind of thinking about this, right, r right, right. Uh, so a big reason uh, that we want to do this is just thinking about uh, the growth in financial services, right. And so there's been uh, there's been a huge growth in kind of digital. Uh, these uh, these devices, uh, the subscri uh, subscriptions to kind of like cellular network uh, providers, and so uh, I, you can think about that over the last twenty years, and then over the last fifteen years, there's been a huge growth in kind of like mobile money, and then maybe over the last like ten years, there's been a growth in digital credit that kind of layers on top of that. Um, and so this is um, a huge uh, right, like th 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 uh, th th uh, this is a really quick adoption curve. Right, and so uh, you can kind of think about like this is a a uh, right right uh, so a situation that's changing pretty rapidly, right? Um, and, and, right, and so we know that there are uh, some uh, some some awesome like, benefits of these services, you know, um, and so uh, the reduction of transaction costs, right, is really important. Um, uh, right, we've seen in a couple of places that uh, that this helps people. Uh, when uh, when they can access these uh, these services uh, to have greater resiliency to risk, whether that's uh, they can like uh, they can like to send money to each other right in a cheaper way, or they can get loans that are small to kind of cover uh, to the, uh, uh, these random expenses, right? And then we've also seen a right right uh, we've seen a degree of like poverty reduction that's due to these services as well. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's uh, there's new risks that uh, that have come out. Of digital financial services, um, and so there's kind of uh, these opportunities, uh, right, 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 uh, for misconduct and fraud. You know, uh, uh, potentially agent fraud, potentially different to, to, uh, different situations when you're cashing in or cashing out with a mobile money product. You know, um, uh, the products are not uh, they're not always fully understood by consumers, right? And so when you ask them, uh, 
right, right. You uh, you quiz them on how they work. They won't always get the uh, the answers right, and so that's important. Mm. There's there's uh, there's uh, there's specific aspects of 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 the digital credit products in particular uh, that can heighten risks. Um, uh, for example, the speed of disbursement. Uh, right, right. We've seen that when you slow down the disbursement of credit, like it's literally the time from when they're approved to when the loan or when they apply to when the loan comes out. Right, you actually have lower default rates. Um, uh, and then just kind of like rapid increases in credit limits can uh, can uh, can be a cause of over indebtedness. And so, um, right. And then of course there are uh, there are solutions that are being uh, that uh, that are being tested. Right. And so. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the increase in like product information and experience uh, I can also help alleviate some of these risks, but uh, there are risks, uh, there's reasons to monitor, right? And then just the last thing is, right, uh, the digital financial services, uh, they're not fixed, right? They haven't been adopted and they're fixed, uh, they're still changing, right? And so just for an example, this is from uh, the Competition Authority, the, uh, uh, the Competition Authority of Kenya. Um, and so this is uh, uh, this pink line, and so, on the left, you have the disbursements, uh, the total disbursements of a credit product, right? And then on the uh, right, right. And then on the right, you have the total, uh, the total amount dispersed, right? And so this pink line is a like new overdraft product, um, and so uh, you can see that this uh, this begins at the beginning of the period, and it um, and it rises to be the top uh, the top product in the market in maybe seven or eight months, right? So you can see that uh, these markets are. Are like pretty fluid, and so uh, 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 the reason to to, uh, to kind of monitor is to keep up, right? In some sense, um, and so uh, the next question, right? Okay, so that's why we do uh, we do market monitoring. Uh, uh, the next question is, right? There's a lot of different methods you can use, right? And so how can you use admit this 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 uh, this particular method, right? And so we're thinking about administrative data, right? So that's any data that's collected and like stored by organizations for operational as well as research purposes. Um, or as opposed to research purposes, excuse me. Um, and so, right, as like digital financial services have grown, uh, uh, the automation, uh, right, right, of, 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 of decision making and kind of the, uh, the use of data means that you need to have um, uh, like really well kept like digitized records. And so uh, the amount of data has grown. Right, but also kind of the uh, the quality of data has grown and the detail of data has grown, and so you have uh, you have records like um, uh, uh, disbursements and when they took place, the fees that were charged and when they took place, the repayments and when they took place, if there were like rollovers, right? You can really get uh, these like super detailed, and that's just looking at kind of digital credit, um, but uh, but some super detailed, uh, uh, just kind of information, um, and so uh, uh, the advantages of this, right? Uh, so you have a lower cost of data collection, right? As compared to maybe a survey or, um, or like an audit study or something like this, which can be, uh, which can be, which uh, which can be, be uh, be be be, uh, be more costly. Um, uh, you have detailed, uh, uh, you have detailed data which is more up to date, um, and so uh, this uh, this is important. But you also have kind of, I you. Right, right, right. You can get the full stream of data over time, so you can kind of map out the evolution. Uh, right, so when you do a survey, you might get two. Uh, uh, the first time you do the survey, and the second time you do, uh, do the survey, and you get like two snapshots out of a film. Right, is the idea, and so this is uh, this is continuous, and so that's nice as well. And then there's just uh, there's just uh, some things about uh, the measurements of outcomes. Right, so if it's difficult to recall outcomes, uh, this can be uh, 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 excuse me, this can be highly advantageous. Right, and then there's um, other certain uh, uh, there's certain like desirability biases that uh, uh, that this can avoid. These they, they, uh, this is people's right uh, their actual behavior of like not their self-reported behavior basically. Um, and so just an example of the kind of of the kind of things you can do. And so this is just looking at um, this. Uh, this is a couple of providers. Um, and so. What what uh, what, uh, what, uh, what we didn't. So this is. Uh, uh, this is a like a, 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 a Venn diagram of accounts um, and kind of uh, who held uh, the accounts at multiple providers. And so uh, you can see, for example, here uh, uh, these accounts or the, uh, these people had accounts at provider G and provider F, right? Uh, and then these people had accounts at at three providers, provider A, right? And so you can kind of see 
uh, there's a lot of overlap. Um, and so uh, th this is the kind of thing that you can, uh, you can identify from this type of data, right? You can really, um, uh, you, you, you can learn a lot. And so in this particular situation, we found out that 6% of our sample, right? Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they had multiple accounts that was um, with, uh, with only a limited number of providers though. And so we would imagine that the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the actual number would be quite higher. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so uh, if, this is just kind of looking at, at the evolution of fee data. And so what you have in this graph here is just the, uh, right, it's the total fees divided by the total loan value, right? Uh, uh, for all of the consumers at that, um, at, 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 at this place. And there's maybe like three things you can get out of this graph, right? So you have uh, these providers, which are all uh, deposit taking institutions, which means they're regulated by uh, the central bank of Kenya. Um, and so there's a little bit of difference in, in like who regulates who, but, uh, but they're like, they're, uh, they're kind of a common group, right? Um, and they're all giving kind of like bullet loans, like one month loans through like a digital credit, uh, through, uh, through like a digital credit application or, or uh, through feature phones. And you can see that these, uh, these prices, uh, they try to go, uh, they try to move away from each other sometimes, but they uh, are actually pretty close. Um, and so that's, uh, that's just kind of, uh, you know, you have some convergence there, right? And then you have um, uh, this, uh, this loan, uh, this loan uh, like non-deposit taking institution. Um, and so you see they have a higher price of credit um, and they're giving like roughly the, the, uh, the same length of loans. And then you have this, this, uh, this, uh, this kind of overdraft product here, right? And you see that uh, uh, the fees are much lower, but also the tenure is much different for those loans. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's right. Right, uh, there's perhaps a reason for that. Um, and so just kind of uh, uh, to wrap up by, uh, uh, by previewing the toolkit. Um, uh, so there are, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of kind of admin data toolkits that are out there. Um, and so uh, the first question that you might have is like, okay, how could I, what, 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 uh, what will this add, right? And so this toolkit is aimed at addressing uh, the unique opportunities and challenges of using digital credit transaction data for consumer protection market monitoring. I would say that we view this as maybe, right, if you're doing something with like a like, right, right, uh, so something that's adjacent, maybe consumer loans or um, or some, some other digital financial service, uh, that it might still be useful for you. Um, but uh, we had to choose a thing to, 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 uh, to kind of uh, to go deep on, right, and so we're doing digital credit, right? Um, and so we view this as a complement to other, uh, uh, to the other toolkits, the other handbooks that are out there. Uh, uh, just a few, uh, right here. Um, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, we'll probably be able to, uh, uh, to post these. Um, but, uh, but these are all, uh, these are all referenced in the toolkit. Um, and so, uh, we look at a couple of digital credit outcomes, and we really look at the definitions to make sure that they're, uh, they're clearly explained. And then the interpretations, right? So what, uh, what do these definitions miss, right? Like how do you interpret them? What, 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 what are these things really telling you, right? Um, uh, we look at the level of aggregation in like data. And so uh, you can go different routes. You can, you, uh, you can aim to get the transaction data, but you could also get, uh, you know, the account data, right? And so what does that change about your, uh, your, uh, your ability to learn about the market uh, like based on that level of aggregation. <clears throat> we, uh, we do a couple of things uh, with consumer segmentation, right? So we talk about uh, uh, the segmentation that uh, that's kind of like better known. So kind of saying like, uh, we're gonna plot means or we're gonna, uh, we're gonna plot distributions by uh, the relevant characteristics, you know, uh, right? Right. Uh, you can look at evolution as we have a little bit already in this presentation, right? But then also, uh, there's uh, there's a different approach to to uh, to, uh, to segmentation that uh, that we have in here, which is uh, to uh, to kind of look at outcomes and to use clustering analysis or excuse me, cluster analysis to kind of break to uh, to, uh, to break consumers into groups uh, that are kind of based on how they behave. And so then you can check uh, you know the demographics of those groups and how they differ, but you could also just 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 kind of think about the policy implications um and so just uh, just some examples right so here's an example of kind of um just i uh, just kind of average loans size by age and gender 
And just to see, you know, like a little bit of like detective work we do here, right? So we look at this. And so first of all, the first thing is that there's um uh, there's a lot of people that don't have gender in this in this data set. So that's a like this is just going to be a limitation. But you see uh, that uh, that the average loan size, right, right, uh, for like women is going to be is right, 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 is like lower at this um, it, right, right, in this full like sample than it is for men, right? And you could say, well, uh, uh, right, 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 right. Uh, perhaps women borrowers aren't as old or something else like that. But we can actually look at gender here as well, right? And we see that actually the uh, the average loan size is larger. At almost every like point in the distribution, um, of of right of, of of excuse me age, um, and so just to just to kind of uh, just to kind of do that detective work, you know, uh, we also have this extremely clear life cycle in the credit uh, we see here. But um, uh, the other thing, right? So, uh, so this is kind of the this this uh, this this uh, this. This uh, this uh, this uh, 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 this kind of outcome segmentation, right? So we used a bunch of borrowing outcomes, and uh, for this we were like really looking at kind of like multiple borrowing and um, and uh, right. And so we took like the like it's the total number of loans, like like the loan size. We took a bunch of variables uh, that are all like digital credit outcomes, and um, and we did a segmentation, and we kind of got th these groups, which I think are pretty instructive, right? So. Um, uh, this uh, this cluster over here turns out to be the highest risk in this. Um, uh, 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 right, and so us uh, so just I uh, just kind of higher risk, uh, risk in terms of default rate. Um, uh, these uh, these uh, these uh, these kinds of cross provider borrowers are basically right. Uh, they're borrowing from from uh, from different providers each month, right. Um, where, 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 as these early and these, uh, these, uh, these, these, uh, 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 these kind of like early and revolving borrowers, they're borrowing uh, uh, from one borrower, uh, from one lender again and again and again, right? And they're sometimes paying back early or they're not expending all their credit, right? So they're going back before the month is over. Um, and so these, uh, these borrowers, uh, they might have different risks than these borrowers because this is really a credit risk, but. Right, uh, so if these borrowers are paying back early, it could really be like the price that they're paying for credit uh, could be the risk. And so this is just kind of an example of how you get these uh, these these, uh, these kind of heterogeneous risks out of this of this uh, this type of data. Um, so I kind of have a pastiche or a uh, um, a collage of these these uh, these different uh, these uh, of the, these of these different other elements. But there's other kind of resources uh, for more in depth. Um, I just kind of analysis of transaction data, uh, there's resources for data security and processing, uh, there's request and planning documents, just, just kind of templates of those, right? Uh, the idea is really to take you from the beginning to the end of the request. And so just to kind of conclude, uh, there's two times on when to consult the toolkit. Uh, so if you're already doing this and you think it's the right thing to do, right? So that's number two actually here, uh, uh, then that's a good time to do it. But also if you're determining right right when this is the right thing to do there's a lot in the toolkit on like uh do you have the capacity to do it do you have the uh, uh the right like staffing and is it going to really be the thing that's going to 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 uh to answer the question that you want to answer right and so this is just kind of when uh we, we we'd uh, we'd say that you should uh, you, uh, uh consult the toolkit so uh, uh thanks for listening to the uh, uh the short presentation and i'm going to turn it back over to Tandu. Thanks so much, Daniel. That was that was really interesting, and I'm excited to welcome our other panelists um, to kind of talk about you know what are the broader implications of this toolkit. And so, you know, my first question for you guys is that you know you all you all um, have worked with regulators and fintechs in, in various different capacities. And um, so, in in your opinion, where are regulators right now in terms of consumer protection, and what kind of use cases do you see for this toolkit? And that's that's anyone if anyone wants to take a first stab at it. Um, maybe I'll. Oh, sorry, <laughs> um, Kevin, you can go first, and then I'll jump in. It's it's. I guess it's good if two panelists want to go to say at the same time. So no, I'm, I'm a gentleman. So ladies first. <laughs> 
Okay, so maybe it is not a bad idea for me to start first because I just want to note that I'm speaking a little bit more broadly, not necessarily directly from the digital credit um, market perspective as is covered by this toolkit, but just more broadly from my perspective in um, having the privilege to talk to different regulators um, in the African context mostly. So I think then Kevin can speak more specifically to um, to this specific angle. So if the question was where are regulators now in terms of consumer protection and in that light, um, what use cases we see for the toolkit, um, I think this toolkit res res resonates really strongly for me with a lot of the work that we've been doing, um, as I said, even not specific, if it's not specifically on credit. Um, I've been talking, for example, to regulators in the Southern African development community, which is a 15, 16 country block, um, about thinking through the framework for financial consumer protection. And we've also been engaging with a network of insurance regulatory authorities, so again, in another field, but very relevant for the toolkit as well, um, with the access to insurance initiative around how to think about aligning the KPIs that you monitor as a regulator and the data sources that you draw on um, with the evolving mandate beyond prudential to, to market conduct and, and, and market development. Um, so I think in all instances, what's, um, what I've realized is that the traditional regulatory monitoring frameworks are often still quite limited on the question of market conduct. And even if there's uh, an acknowledgement of the need to move to more risk-based market conduct uh, supervision, the tools and the frameworks um, are often not yet orientated um, in that direction. Um, so I think in, in, in terms of where regulators are at, just in, in the work that I've done, um, I've seen it, the message has been that um, it's important to understand really what it is that you want to achieve within your mandate and then to know what is it that you want to know that you want to measure uh, to help you meet that mandate. So I think that is that is always uh, the starting point. And then from there to take stock of, you know, what are the different potential indicators that speak to that purpose? Um, and there can be a whole host of them and then sort of whittling it down to ask um, what is called to prioritize in your context and given the capacity realities of the market and the regulatory authority alike. So I think Daniel picks up on all of these elements um, in the toolkit, toolkit. And then I think if you, have, if you know what it is that you want to measure, then a big part of the thinking is to then ask what are the potential data sources. Um, and I think often the starting point still is reported data. And the broadening of the perspective that we're seeing is what, are, what about those alternative data sources, um, such as consumer surveys and mystery shoppings, but then also, I think, as this toolkit outlines, um, administrative data. And I think um, one might often still be a little bit afraid of administrative data just because it is so big and, you know, where do you start? So I think the design and implementation process sort of to to get the right data in the right format, you know, compatible across providers and how to analyze it in a, in a meaningful way to ultimately inform your decisions um, and to do that within the capacity constraints of the authority, I think is a, um, is a big question. And there's of course a big danger that you go through all the motions to get the data that you don't then sufficiently mine um, or, or utilize. Um, so then to come back to the question of um, the use cases of the toolkit. So I definitely think it serves a very important use case. Um, and as I said, maybe because I'm from a slightly different background, for me, the, the usefulness of this toolkit uh, is not just in the credit market, but I can also, when going through it, see it more broadly, um, just the usefulness of informing regulatory authorities and market players about the value that can lie in directly tapping into the operational data. So actually it's broadening the perspective for consumer protection um, data, but then also the practicalities and the considerations that go along with such a, uh, such a grant ambition. So it's both an advocacy use case for the administrative data, and then I think also a pragmatic use case. Um, what is needed for, for success. Um, I think I'll hand over to Kevin. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll answer the question um, from just my experience as chairman and the 
what you know what's happening in the sector right now and why it's important that this toolkit uh, has come at this point. So the CBK Amendment um, Act was recently passed into law in December, which then asked the gave powers to the central bank to create regulations for the digital lending ecosystem, and they called we are now known as digital credit providers. And this has um, what what came out very quick, clearly was that a large, the biggest reason that this um, regulation was put into place was consumer protection, right? So they had several clauses um, around how to treat a customer around debt collection, what kind of uh, marketing um, guidelines that there will be, um, um, and, and various others, uh, uh, prescriptive um, <clears throat> regulations on consumer protection. In addition to that, um, the Insurance Regulatory Authority and the um, the Communications Authority recently held a World Consumer Rights um, Day uh, in Mombasa, and they asked um, all the ecosystem players, particularly from our ecosystem of fintech and digital finance, to come to and speak um, about the shared uh, concerns around consumer protection, particularly in credit. Um, and I think that was um, partly informed by the report the IPA did, I think it was in 2020 or 2021, um, that sort of formed the agenda and the talking points uh, for consumer protection. So what's my, my, in conclusion, I guess what I'm saying is um, this toolkit could not have come at a better time. Um, the regulatory framework, not just in Kenya, but across the region, um, Ghana, for example, has just um, <clears throat> set up a, um, a sandbox ecosystem at, at their central bank. Um, <clears throat> Zambia is trying to position itself as the hub for startups and, and, and digital finance. And so, and, and then the Bank of Uganda is coming to Kenya next month to engage with the ecosystem here to learn from us. And so this toolkit is quite relevant now. And um, as a chair, for example, what I'll be doing is I'll be sharing it with these different ecosystem players to give them some guidance um, as to you know, what they need to do and what to, they need to look for. But more importantly, um, the benefits of having data um, to help them design uh, relevant regulation, particularly because um, our markets are, are nuanced. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so I wanted to ask a question kind of like building off what Christine said around um, around relevant indicators. Um, so for, for all of you, um, what are the types of indicators specifically related to consumer protection risks that you really think administrative data can help to identify? Um, are there certain indicators that you think it's, it's better at identifying or are there, are there certain indicators that it's less good at? Maybe I can start that one and also take a moment just to just to reflect on the last question and and the use cases. I mean, I my experience is is mostly, of course, in the UK and and the Netherlands and Europe more broadly, and and still I see lots of relevance for for the toolkit. I think it's a really handy um, guide and step by step um, process for anyone thinking about administrative data collection um, in general, in fact. I mean, it could be financial services, but even more broadly, just to go through some of those steps of thinking, what are you aiming for? Um, how should you construct your data? What do you need to think about in terms of um, data protection? And how should you frame your questions um, to providers? So so well done to IPA and to Daniel. I think it's a, it's a really um, great piece of work. In terms of, you know, digital lending, um, digital financial services, and the kind of indicators that I think um, administrative data is really helpful for. I mean, I think the key one, and this comes out quite a bit in, in the report, is around unaffordability, right? So where do we see individuals building up um, levels of debt that, that, that either on the face of it or um, in the future become uh, uh, sort of unaffordable and, and in 
uh, end up being um, uh, going into default and in other other systems. And and you really, it's really difficult to get that kind of information from more traditional sources such as surveys, where you might be worried that um, consumers might not answer truthfully. Uh, being in debt is you know not something that people often want to admit to. Um, and so being able to really, uh, yeah, and not only that, and they don't want to admit to it, they also might not be keeping track of it very well, right? That's one of the problems that they may be facing is they may have multiple lines of credit across different providers, across different time horizons, and just the cognitive task of keeping track of all of that just doesn't work. And so these two factors really make me think, actually, to really understand unaffordable lending and individuals, individual firms perhaps handing out loans that end up becoming unaffordable, you really need to be looking at the administrative data. And, and, um, and Daniel talks about that um, quite a lot in, in both this toolkit, but in previous work uh, that he's done with IPA. So um, yeah, to me, that's key. Um, I'm curious. I mean, that's, that's certainly relevant in the UK and the work that I was doing there and overdrafts and credit cards and payday lending, um, but curious to hear from the other panelists uh, what they think as well. Uh, right, and so just to add, and just to, just to thank you for, uh, for, the, for those comments, but, um, but, th but there's other certain things that I definitely think uh, that administrative data is better for uh, this uh, this idea of like total over indebtedness is like definitely one of those um, right. There's uh, there's places where it's not the best tool, right? So just to just uh, just to kind of think about you know there's other uh, places where uh, there's digital lenders that are you know uh, perhaps like harassing uh, uh, consumers on like debt collection or doing something else, right? If, if this isn't going to be on the ledger, right? And so you need to think about Right, right, right. Just, I just kind of the way to think about this, right, right. When you're using this administrative data, you have to think about, okay, what's on the ledger, what's off the ledger, right? And the stuff that's on the ledger, you can really get to with this. And the stuff that's more like, uh, like agent fraud or misconduct, right? You might need to take a different approach. And so I think th th this uh, this conversation is also just just uh, just important to think about this as a uh, as um, right, right, right. So this shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. Right, like if you're trying to get at all of these different the, uh, the, the, uh, these different questions, but it's definitely complementary to these other these uh, the, 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 uh, these uh, these other approaches, kind of mystery shopping and like surveys and uh, uh, using credit bureau data, for example. You know, there's a lot of different like data sources that you, that you can kind of combine, and then using the reported data from the the um, right and the complaints data as well. Right, and so just to kind of think about it, right, it's. But it's really about what's on the ledger, you know. And so, um, a repayment. It's great to look at repayment because you know uh, 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 these uh, these firms track the repayment really, really well. It's it's extremely important to do that, right? Uh, so, uh, so something like that. Yeah. So, Daniel, maybe I can then chip in just to say I definitely agree with you, and I like that part of the toolkit that says it's about you know if you're clear about what you want to measure, what is the scope of what you have within your data sets and then to see um, what indicators you can you can draw on from that. And I definitely agree with your point that you might need to bring in different data sources to speak to different um, aspects. But I just also wanted to add that I find it very useful um, when talking about indicators to have some framework against which you can um, position it. And um, I think that the CGAP consumer outcomes framework is, is a really good way of positioning sort of what is the end goal that you want in terms of positive consumer outcomes. Um, and that you can then apply that to sort of fit the different indicators into and, and to see what speaks to that from, from different data sources and obviously the TCF framework um, as well. Thanks, everyone. Um, so my my next question is, um, do you think we're at a point or wh when do you think we'll be at a point for um, fintechs to be able to embed administrative data into kind of like their long term monitoring plan? Um, and to add to that, there's a question in the chat that I think is relevant that do you think administrative data can not only be used for like monitoring 
after, you know, folks have taken on loans or do you think it can be used as kind of like a screening tool as well? So do you think this can be used to kind of like protect consumers before they even become, um, before they take on multiple loans or before they kind of like get into a situation where they, they've overborrowed? <clears throat> Maybe I could try. Um, so one of the challenges we had um, in the association when we were trying to um, design a data sharing um, platform with the ecosystem to try and solve for vendettedness was um, most the big, and let me be clear, the large digital lenders feared that um, we, the smaller digital lenders were going to reverse engineer um, their algorithms. The second one was because there is, um, you know, there's, there's an X, the market is finite. And what you tend to find is the larger players have identified the best customers in our market. And so the other fear was that um, we don't want customers or other lenders to know who these best customers are because then they will take them away from us. So that's usually the challenge of um, embedding this type of administrative uh, data. Now, are there solutions? Um, of course they are. Um, I think anonymizing certain aspects of the data, I think um, uh, one of the things we realized is what data sets are we sharing so that you know they're not material to business decisioning, but are material in giving insight to you know, client X has tried to take six loans over the last six weeks, um, was able to get four and has five live loans at the current time. Now, we don't know their name, we don't know the phone number, but we may know their gender and we may know um, the average ticket size of each of those loans. Um, and so I think there's solutions, but those are the challenges um, we faced when trying to run a project like this. I hope that tries to answer the question. Does anyone else wanna to speak to um, the possibility of embedding administrative data into a long-term uh, monitoring strategy? Uh, so I don't have uh, the expertise on this, but just from the way that I, just, I, just, I just from the way that I view it, Right. I think um, that, 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 that there's this very aspirational case, which is like, you know, it would be quite costly and it would be kind of uh, uh, the ability to kind of like to, 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 uh, to, uh, to query data in like real time. And so there would be right an exchange set up, there would be kind of a third party that runs that exchange. And then uh, there'd be a bank that would kind of pull that data. Right. And so that's like, this is like the ultimate aspirational case where you're just like monitoring in real time. It seems like in the uh, the world as it exists, even you know when you look at uh, the monitoring of right of like places like FCA and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, that that's not always the case. It's often much more you know you do like an inquiry, you pull this data as like a one time thing, and then you get a like chunk of data and you use it to learn about the market and you learn the state of the market. You learn uh, some uh, some important uh, uh, things about like changes. Maybe there's a policy that was. Uh, that was placed during that time. And so I think I just want to be like a little bit, um, just I just kind of like a little bit realistic about that. But I also want to kind of to, to, uh, to flag that there is this kind of uh, this, uh, this really exciting possibility that could be, you know, like like pretty, right, right which could be pretty far, 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 far down the line to kind of uh, to think about this in real time or like virtually real time, you know. Um, and it looks like Paul has something too to add as well. Yeah, just sticking my hand up just to, to jump on the back of what you said, Daniel, and, and mostly, yeah, to agree, definitely from a regulator's perspective and the work that I was doing at the FCA, this is certainly my understanding, right? This, the aspiration of having a real-time data pool that you can just dip into, I mean, they're working on it for sure, but it's not a reality yet. Um, and so, your toolkit is really a sort of aspirational best in class example of, of where you would want to get to, but, but let's be realistic. And I also wanted to give a, a slight 
Um, you know, the original question you asked, Tanvi, was around, you know, the, rea the reality of fintechs doing this for themselves and, and um, in their sort of day-to-day -day work. And I, um, I definitely don't want to sort of um, downplay the incentives that, that fintechs might have, but I think one of the main problems we see in consumer lending markets is not necessarily the actions of an individual uh, lender, but more likely the combined um, sort of lending from multiple lenders to the same individual. And so whilst a fintech could invest quite a lot in monitoring and evaluating these kind of things, and arguably they might have an incentive to if they want to reduce default rates in the long term, they still might not see a big part of the problem, which is uh, individuals uh, borrowing from other sources. And so this, this really points to some form of kind of information market failure, which you would want to you know, fix through some form of credit information sharing. So a credit bureau or other sort of credit agencies. So, so whilst there are incentives for fintechs to do this, I don't, I don't think that's the entire solution. There has to be a, you know, a third party somewhere, whether that's a commercial third party or a, or a regulated re, sort of regulatory agency that's looking at the, the sort of what the bigger picture. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. And that, that was a question I actually had. Um, it, like, is, is consumer protection monitoring a strategic investment for fintechs? And if it's not, if it's not there yet, then how do we, how do we frame the issue as such? And I think you, you, you touched on that a little bit, but I'd love to hear from other folks if they have thoughts. Um, can I try? Please so go ahead. In, term, in, in terms of uh, is, is fintech not yet there? I think it's all dependent on the market. Um, I think in Kenya, with the new regulation in play, you're having um, a shift in the market. Um, and when I say shift, what does that mean? Um, the way we're going to be presenting our products has to be in a very specific way. The way we get the licensing done, it involves um, giving our pricing models um, and giving an, a very good description of complaints processes, um, messages we send to customers, um, pricing and terms and conditions. Um, so what do I mean? <clears throat> if there's ever a time to try and embed um, an initiative that had administrative data being collected by a third party, um, say like the central bank or an association for the purposes of monitoring uh, for consumer protection issues. Um, in Kenya, for example, the time would be now, right? So I think if we are not able to achieve anything substantial within the next six months, um, anything thereafter will be more difficult because then precedents will be set. Um, and then the other thing that's happening um, in Kenya is that the, the, there's an election, so you can't not take that um, in there. And the, what that means is there's going to be a new change of guard and at the central bank as well, you're going to have a change of guard June 2023 and several other regulators. So my point is, Right now, you know that the regulators are um, friendly to this kind of thinking, and there are initiatives and new, um, <clears throat> new there's new regulation that's being enforced and enacted as we speak. And so if there was a time, um, I'd say in Kenya, this is the time. I, I hope that makes sense. I can't speak to the other markets um, because, I'm not being involved as deeply as I would like to, but if this webinar was happening a week from now, um, I'd have told you what Uganda, Bank of Uganda is thinking, for example, because we are meeting them next week. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so if I can add to what Kevin has said, so I, I can't speak to the fintech angle, but on the regulatory side, my suspicion, it, well, my impression, um, just from my engagements with a few regulators, is that it, I would definitely think it's a, a strategic priority, but your question was, is it a strategic investment? So I think to get from a priority, because you've got a market conduct mandate, you have to measure this, to, to actual investment is maybe not so simple. Um, I think it requires a strong champion. It requires regulatory changes that take time, that take time um, institutional structure changes. Basically, a, a, a patient process of broadening the suite of market monitoring tools. So, so I suspect that the broadening of the focus uh, beyond reported data to administrative data will definitely be compelling um, in theory or on paper but it's a resource intensive process to implement and to embed in your whole institutional sort of and decision-making um, structures in, process, in practice. And actually what Paul said made me think, this is not unlike sort of the thinking that's also ongoing around open, open finance and where you want to be eventually, as, as Daniel said, where they are, um, API structure set in where you can sort of real time plug into into the data, um, but it, it just given the context constraints, it it might um, still be some time to get there. But that doesn't mean that it's not uh, meaningful to embark on the journey. Thank you. Um, so I have a question in the chat from Amelia. Um, so if a regulator does use this tool and finds examples of certain um, groups of customers being in default or being potentially discriminated against, what would then be the response by the regulator? Um, so I think it's really about who would be using this data? What would then the response be? Would it be the regulator be involved in corrective action? Or would it be that the regulator is, is telling the fintech to take some kind of action or, or vice versa? I, I mean, just to start on that one, if I if I can, it feels like I always try to think about sort of data or research more broadly, perhaps in in terms of you know uh, identifying risks, diagnosing risks, or what's causing those risks, right? Like root cause diagnosis, and then developing effective solutions. And you can kind of think of research in those. Or at least I, when I was at the regulator, I was thinking in those three terms. And I think what the toolkit is focused on and this administrative data is particularly useful for is identifying risks. And, and then I guess the question is, how are you going to use that, right? And I think different regulators or supervisors will take different approaches according to um, the other tools available to them. So at the FCA, lots of the administrative data work that we did actually contributed to policy change. So we weren't interested in corrective and, uh, action on a, a few individual firms. We were using administrative data to develop, um, to understand the market and then to develop uh, new policy, which would be um, effective for the entire market. But of course, that's just one example. And I think it is perfectly legitimate to also think about, okay, well, if we're collecting this data and we see a particular firm is doing particularly high risk lending or um, discriminatory lending of other forms, then it seems perfectly natural to ask the question of the firm to explain themselves, like, you know, not presuming guilt, but at least to ask the questions. But then that also sort of has a knock on implication for how you collect the data. And, and Daniel goes into this a little bit in the toolkit is, then you, get, then you can't sort of anonymize the data too much because you at least want to understand the firm identifiers in the data so that you can go back and have a look at the individual firms. Whereas sometimes you might actually want to just anonymize the firms completely, right? So that you know there are different firms, but you don't necessarily know which firms are which. So this all goes, I think, to Daniel's point and, and points that Christine has made as well is, you know, you start at the end, right? Think about the indicators that you're looking for and the outcomes that you're gonna, you know, the actions that you're gonna take based on the indicators you're looking for and then work backwards 
uh, from there to think about how you're going to collect the data and in what form and how anonymized you want to make the data. And if I can just add um, something that just occurred to me as you, was, as you were talking through what I agree are, are definitely all relevant angles, but uh, I just want to add that often regulatory authorities, they do have a core consumer protection mandate, but they also have a market development mandate. So I think even just um, analyzing at an industry level the trends and showing some of those graphs uh, like Daniel illustrated and publishing that can also uh, be used to sort of prompt the market and as a sort of proactive market engagement tool also on where innovation could be um, could be appropriate to not only improve protection but also actually grow the market uh, responsibly. Uh, so I have two things uh, to add for that. Um, and so the first is just kind of uh, to go back and think about and, and so, uh, so this is to, uh, just to kind of add to Paul's point of right, right you have to think about like what you're going to do with the data right right so first and then build the, the, uh, the this uh, this uh, this kind of data request around that. And so um, right, right like in terms of uh, you know handing out uh, potential actions, Right, it really depends on on kind of like what your mandate is, right? And then you also have to think about um, right. So the mandate could be that uh, if there's enough things that uh, that draw red flags, then you look closer. Uh, uh, but the mandate could be uh, it could uh, right. Uh, so it could be something else. But that's just an example. And then the other thing is kind of thinking about right. And so the question I think right uh, this mentioned uh, like gender outcomes in particular, right? And so just uh, just taking means between. Uh, two gender groups it's you know it's like a pretty right like it's a pretty inexact thing it's hard to attribute right what was going on there without thinking about you know the different uh the different dynamics that could be happening uh if, 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 if right if like the men have had credit for a long time and the women have not you know right right and the kind of systemic things and so i think you need to be uh just 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 i uh, just kind of careful when you're looking at that angle Right in terms of right, it can draw red flags, but understanding, you know, right. Uh, so is this a conduct issue? Is this an issue with uh, the market as it stands? You know, and like, what are the are the solutions? Is it really is the solution to punish people, or is the solution to do something else? And so, just to kind of like be clear and like thinking about the interpretation of these things, I think that's a really and that's uh, this is a thing that we tried to emphasize within the toolkit is just like right, like how far can you take these indicators? Um. Um, I, I think that was a good concluding questions. I don't, I don't know if anyone else has any kind of closing thoughts on, on kind of like the broader implications of this toolkit, um, final words. I only want to say thanks to IPA and thanks to Daniel and uh, looking forward to using the toolkit myself and like getting my hands dirty with uh, with some data and, and putting it into practice. Yeah, thank you. And uh, just a thanks to all the panelists again uh, uh, for coming and having such a great discussion on these uh, these issues. Um, it's greatly appreciated. So and um, and to everyone who's listening from different places in the world at different times. Uh. I think mine is to say thanks to Daniel um, <clears throat> for the good work. Um, I'm definitely going to use the toolkit and share it with everyone I can and see how we can make our ecosystem better because I think this is a good idea and good luck. Yeah, likewise, I think there's um, not, not much further I can add. So yeah, thanks. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Um, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, we'll post the recording of, of this conversation on our website, along with a link to the toolkit. Um, so if you have any other questions, I dropped our email in the chat and, and we're happy to hear any other reactions and feedback you all have. Um, so thanks so much and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>